Bibles, open to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tonight. Appreciate you taking time to be here in church. It's not about me, it's not about you, it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And already my heart's been encouraged as I've been studying for the messages for today, for Wednesday, and for next Sunday, already turning my heart toward just this special week. An amazing week, a week that has eternal consequences and effect. No other week in human history has had the same effect on human history like this week, Passion Week. The week began with Jesus Christ entering in on a donkey, on a, on a colt, and it finished with him in the tomb. And the next week began, early Sunday morning, with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What a powerful week. Imagine being there that week, being one of the disciples or being a friend of Jesus Christ, not an enemy, but a friend of Jesus Christ, and thinking this was it, the range of emotions, then this is not it, to what? I fear, as Christians, that we become easily cold and calloused. I fear that because I know J.D. way too well. I know how quickly I can become calloused and cold to the truths from the word of God, to the power of God and the gospel. And this sermon tonight is as much or more for me than for anyone else in here. But I want to challenge you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and then we're going to be in the book of Psalms. And so we're going to do some major, some major turning in scripture tonight and uh, be in a few places. And so stay with me if you can, and we'll start in Corinthians, we'll end in Corinthians, and in the middle we'll be through the rest of the Bible. Fair enough, and we'll just kind of go cover to cover tonight, and we'll be out probably by Wednesday by the Lord's Supper. If not, we'll just go right into communion service, and if that doesn't take us through, we'll go right to Easter, to Easter morning, and so I'm, I'm in it for the long haul, aren't you? Amen? Yeah, you don't mean that, and so I'll see all you at the altar tonight for lying in church. <laughs> first Corinthians chapter 15, we'll look at those first six verses. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. This passage, again, reminding us he's preaching to Christians tonight. Listen, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you're online you've never trusted the Lord and believed in Jesus Christ, I I challenge you tonight to believe in Jesus Christ, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Right To believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for the sins of the world, and that by asking him for, for forgiveness, he will freely offer it. Jesus has never turned anyone away. It is the best, it is the best offer I can ever know about. But this passage here, he said, you believed, you've received, and this is what you stand on. And my friends, my friends, this is many of your testimony. You have believed in Jesus Christ, and you stand on Jesus Christ. Listen, you're back to church on a Sunday night. You're in church on a Sunday night. There's many other things you could be doing in the cold, chilly spring weather in Michigan. You say, of course, pastor, we we stand on this. Let's look at verse number two. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. How great is your dedication to Jesus Christ? How great? Tonight I want to point out in the book of Psalms and then really throughout Scripture we find Jesus clearly portrayed, absolutely declared, a shining, brilliant gospel light And I wonder how great is our dedication. I was preparing this message and came across an interesting, an interesting happening. Some of you are aware that that, uh, tomorrow, yesterday and tomorrow then, is the NCAA tournament. Some are aware, some are aware and don't care, and some have no idea what I'm talking about. This tournament happens every year, March Madness, culminating in the Final Four Saturday night, and then the two teams will play this Monday night. One team still in the tournament is University of Connecticut, UConn. I do not 
I'm probably offend half of you. I don't care who wins. I don't care who wins. If you care, God bless you. If you made a bracket and your bracket's busted, I'm sorry. If you're hanging on for dear life to one of your picks, good. Well, God bless you. I hope, I hope you do well. I don't care tonight. Don't care tomorrow. But I was reading about University of Connecticut, UConn, and they've been in this scenario before. But something caught my attention it was last week, a little over a week ago now. On the 22nd of March, Ramadan began. It's a Muslim holiday, Muslim observance. I found out that on UConn's team, there are three devoted Muslim players. I found on the 22nd that UConn was actually playing that night against another team, Gonzaga. And during the day, if you observe this particular holiday, you don't eat or drink from sunup to sundown. What caught my attention was that this was a very, very big game for this team and for these men who may never, ever be on this stage again. And never be on the stage of basketball, and it's only basketball. All right, if you love it, great, but it doesn't matter in life, does it? We're probably not going to be playing basketball in heaven. Soccer, but not basketball. <laughs> Read your Bible, you'll know that I'm wrong. <laughs> Basketball doesn't matter, does it? But I found out, I discovered an article that, that these three players, from some to some down before, the, probably the, the, the largest game they ever would have played in, did not set aside their beliefs. They fasted from sunup to sundown and then slammed down oranges and coconut juice, co coconut milk, before the game. They won that game. They played last night. I think the tip-off time was 8, 8-something, eight 8.49 or something like that. I just know it was after sundown, but only by a few minutes. And once again, I checked it today, the Star Center and a couple other players did not eat or drink from sunup till sundown. It struck me, because I, of course, was preparing for these messages and challenging us to observe this week with the Lord, have our minds focused. I beg to ask the question of myself and of you, how dedicated are we to Jesus Christ? How could it be that someone who's playing basketball who believes in a false religion, in a false God, as committed as they are, how or why or should they be more committed than those who have the truth? From Jesus Christ. I wonder how committed are you to Jesus Christ? How much dedication do you have? I want to challenge us tonight in that thought, but I want us to look. We've been preaching through Psalms on Sunday nights. So we're going to go to Psalms. So keep 1 Corinthians 15 open if it's on your phone as a tab, if it's, if it's a real Bible, all right, in the sense of a, a physical Bible. Keep a marker there, a finger. We're going to come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to go to Psalms. So turn to Psalms, and I want us to look at the next few moments, Jesus Christ presented in Psalms. Jesus Christ, his coming, was not haphazard. In fact, in Psalms, we read those little words according to the Scriptures. And throughout the Scripture, throughout the Bible, we have the prophecy, the unique prophecy that Jesus Christ fulfilled. And I want us to look at three specific fulfilling of prophecies from Psalms, that we see in Psalm and then in, in Jesus Christ. First, turn to Psalm chapter 2, if you would please. Psalm chapter 2. We know from a Bible class, from Sunday school, and from the Word of God, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We read it clearly in the book of Matthew about how the, the Virgin Mary, in the book of Luke, how the Virgin Mary was visited by an angel and then touched by the Holy Ghost himself. His conception was no normal conception. He is the Son of God. But thousands of years before it actually took place, 
Hundreds of years before the prophecy fell in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, behold, a virgin shall conceive. And I want to tell you something. People want to discount that prophecy. They want to say that Hebrew word doesn't mean a virgin. It means a young girl. Don't they? They want to say that. They want to say, behold, a young girl shall have a child. Now, understand that this makes no sense at all. Because the Bible says, the Lord, behold, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. All right, so God is saying, I will give you a sign from me. And think about what they're saying. This is a sign from God. A girl will have a baby. That's not a sign. All right, that's not a sign. That was, was what happens in creation from Genesis chapter 1. No, no, no. The sign from God that, behold, I'll give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Unique. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But we see the prophecy in Psalm chapter 2. Look, please, in verse number 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine the vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together, saith the Lord, and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. If you mark in your Bibles, I would highlight verses 6 and 7, a direct reference to the Son of God. This day have I begotten thee. Continue in the passage, ask of me, I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest ye be angry with, be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. I don't know all that the psalm writer knew when he penned this song, these lyrics of this song. We know that the Holy Ghost was working through all the writers of the Bible. And perhaps he thought that the words sounded nice, not realizing that God himself was moving to make a great prophecy, the most powerful prophecy that the Son of God would come to earth. Listen, it is amazing, it is amazing what, Christ, what God has done, but there is nothing more amazing that God would send his son. What a familiar verse, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he, what? Gave his only, what's the next word? Begotten son. My son, this day have begotten thee. Kiss the son lest he be angry. Blessed are all they that trust in him. I love Matthew 3, verse 17, and low a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. A few times while Jesus Christ was on earth, God spoke literally, physically, verbally from heaven. And those around heard the voice of God. I've often wondered what that sounded like. One time was here at the baptism, another time at the Mount of Transfiguration. But I don't think anyone looked around to see if someone was humanly speaking. However this voice sounded, when God's voice spoke, there was no doubt that this was God himself. The author of life, the almighty Jehovah, speaking from the heaven. And we see Jesus Christ clearly, clearly prophesied as the son of God. The Romans, the multitudes, the religious leaders joined together and formed a, a coalition with one common enemy, Jesus of Nazareth. Herod wanted to get rid of him. Pontius Pilate wanted nothing to do with him. 
The Pharisees and Sadducees were jealous of him. And the crowd, easily manipulated. The crowd, who no doubt had been touched by the power of Jesus Christ. Who no doubt, as you, if you'd gone through a crowd that day in Jerusalem, there was no doubt in my mind that you would have found those who had been healed by Jesus Christ. John tells us that if all the works of Jesus were written down, that the books of the world could not contain them. Now you can say that's hyperbole, but I prefer to believe the Bible like it is. Which means that Jesus Christ went around doing a whole bunch of good things. All over the place. Names, situations, and people. Moms and dads, sons and daughters, wives and husbands, and demons cast out, and all ailments, ailments, everything these things done. So no doubt in my mind, you went through this crowd this day when they, were, when they were crying out to crucify him. There were those that were touched by the power of Jesus Christ. Maybe somebody eaten of the bread and the fish. Ate fed 5,000 and 4,000 plus more. Maybe some, some, as they were crying out to crucify him, were looking at him with eyes that were previously closed by scales. And they formed a coalition. They were co so concerned with the Roman Empire rather than with Jesus Christ that they cried out to release Barabbas. We don't want... Jesus, we'd rather have Barabbas. The truth is, nothing has changed in 2,000 years. Nothing has changed in 2,000 years. We look around the world. We look at the planet. We live in a beautiful place. I'll tease about Michigan, and sure, at some point we're going to have spring and summer and fall and winter, maybe in the same afternoon. If I... Could change one thing. Maybe spring would come a little bit earlier. You know, mid-July. But we live in a beautiful place in Michigan, do we not? This earth is a beautiful place. You see the natural wonders, the seven natural wonders of the world. You can see waterfalls and mountains. Many of you have posted pictures of a sunrise. A sunrise. But they can be breathtaking, can they not? We have rain and snow. The Bible says he, calls, he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. There's springtime and harvest. So many blessings that we reap. And yet, and yet, there are not many that are blessed by putting their trust in him. The psalm says he's the son and blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Not only do we see the deity of Jesus Christ we see his crucifixion. I want you to use your imagination. Now some of you adults will have a little trouble doing this. Children, you're with me in a second. I want you to think back a thousand and fifty years ago. Call it 963 A.D. You with me so far? Let me paint the, let me paint the historical picture for you. All right, Europe during this time, uh, was only sparsely inhabited by barbarian tribes. America, as we know it, would not be for another 500 years or so. But in 963, what if there was a document that was written predicting the death of a man a thousand years later? And pretend that in 963, the death that was predicted, that was foretold, would be told about a chariot not pulled by horses, an iron chariot. A death that would affect the entire world. Within a few minutes, everyone, or a few hours, everyone would know about it. If you read this document in 963 A.D., you would think, this is crazy. There is no way that this event could happen. You couldn't even imagine it. And that's just the death of John Kennedy on November 22nd, 1963. If we found a document like that from 963 A.D. predicting the death of John Kennedy, we would, we would be astonished. 
that I want us to look in Psalm 22. As we see the crucifixion foretold of Jesus Christ. Someone said that you ought to approach this psalm with the utmost reverence because you quite possibly have never stood on holier ground than this psalm. You'll understand the first because it's very familiar. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Sound familiar? Some believe that Jesus actually quoted the entire psalm while on the cross. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. Sound familiar yet? Despised of the crowd? Look at verse 7. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying... He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Do you remember that from the crucifixion account? The religious leaders, the Pharisees, they mocked Jesus Christ with almost that exact quotation. Saying, you saved everyone else, save yourself. If you're really the son of God. Verse 9, but thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art from God, from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. What did Jesus Christ say on the cross? I thirst. I thirst. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Verse 16. For dogs have compassed me. What did the Jews call the Gentiles? We sacrificed between two thieves. One is left, one is right. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones they look And stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. What did the soldiers do at the feet of of the cross? They cast lots. They cast lots for the robe of Jesus Christ. Foretold here in Psalm 22, thousands. Years at least prior. Predicting a death by crucifixion. And crucifixion had not even been invented yet. Not invented. Look at verse 19. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. I think one of the saddest statements that Jesus Christ makes It's found in verse number one on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The only time that we know in in the history of of eternality where God the Father and God the Son were separated. Where God the Father turned his back on his Son, Jesus Christ. And he turned his back for one reason and one reason alone, sin. And it wasn't for his sin. It's my sin. 
My sin caused God the Father and God the Son to literally be separated. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But there's one more prophecy we see in Psalms. Turn back a few pages to Psalm chapter 16. Because the gospel is not the gospel without the resurrection. In Psalm chapter 16, <laughs> look in verse number 9 and 10. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell or in the grave. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. We'll read this next Sunday morning, but let me read you from Matthew chapter 28. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Significance in the fact that the angel sat on the stone. This stone was to make sure that no one would disrupt the body of Jesus Christ. Remember, the religious leader said, listen, the, the, the disciples said, or the disciples are going to steal the body. He said he'd rise again. So put this big stone here. This is our solution to stop Jesus. A big stone. And an angel sat on the stone. Your big plan was merely a chair for the Son of God. And the angel sat on the chair on that stone. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Big, rough, and tough. Roman soldiers, shaking like a couple of schoolgirls on the ground. And then beyond that, they became as dead. That's how afraid they were. And the angel answered and said to the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. <laughs> I love the invitation. Come see the place where the Lord lay. There's, I don't know about you, but I can put myself there for a moment. These, these ladies are, are frightened. They've never seen an angel like this before and never will again in their life as far as we know. These big, tough soldiers are, are shaking. The, they're worried on the way. Who's going to roll the stone away? They didn't have to worry. It already been rolled away. The angel's sitting on it. He's like, he's not here. But by the way, do you, do you want to see where he was at? Do you want, do you want, do you want a tour? It's empty, but you can have a tour. It's free admission. All right, come see the place where the Lord lay. Oh, isn't that nice? All right, and you can walk away now. Like, just imagine what, what Christ has done for us. <laughs> There's a young preacher who was suddenly called upon to preach a funeral sermon. He had hunted through all the four Gospels trying to find one of Christ's funeral sermons. But he searched in vain because he found out that Jesus Christ broke up every funeral that he ever attended. <laughs> Death could not exist where Jesus Christ came into the picture. When the dead heard his voice, they sprang to life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Someone once said, it's a good thing that Jesus, that Jesus called Lazarus' his name when he said, come forth. Because if he hadn't said Lazarus, all of the tombs would have emptied. And I believe in the power of God. I believe absolutely that would have happened. But only Lazarus came forth that day. So go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you would, as we close tonight. This is a week above all other weeks, a week that was foretold and fulfilled, a week that brings everlasting life to all that believe, a week that brings change and transformation. And Jesus Christ shines in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is revealed in the Psalms. Jesus Christ is foretold in the prophecy. Jesus Christ is declared in the Gospels. And Jesus Christ vindicates the world and himself in Revelation. But will Jesus Christ, but will Jesus Christ Will he be seen in you or in me? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We read the first six verses. Continue, please, in verse number seven, just a few more. 
After that, he was seen of James and of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Last few days, some people who don't believe in Jesus Christ have had a strong commitment to their false teaching, their false God. We have the truth. How committed are we? We have the truth. We see it in the Psalms. Just three passages in the Psalms, and you see the power of the gospel. Unbelievable. And we could take the next day and every day go through Scripture and see all of the prophecies and, and see how everyone was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. So what he asks of us is not too much. What he expects of us is not too great. Our success can often be seen. Our talent can be on display. But how often can our Savior be seen? I'll leave you with these four verses. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled with, to God. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Christ, Jesus Christ is in you. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. My friends, if you trust in Jesus Christ, you have the hope of glory right here inside of you. Is Christ being seen in you? Or does someone who does not have the hope of Christ have a greater dedication and a greater commitment and a greater resolve to false teaching than you or I do to the truth from the Word of God? This week, most important week in human history, may Christ be seen. Music